Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great British Dig on Behind the Trowel. I've just realized I've got the window open so hopefully you don't hear a delay. Um, so welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the latest episode. Today we are joined by none other than Mark Newman. So we're going to do some introductions. Mark, please take it away. Who are you? What's your role with the National Trust? Etc. Hello. Hi, I'm the uh, archaeologist for the east side of the north region of the National Trust. So I advise and support properties going up to just outside Berwick upon Tweed in the upper right hand corner down to the Pennine boundaries of Greater Manchester in the bottom left hand corner. So about 75 National Trust properties um, and pretty much in the middle of those is Fountains Abbey and Studley Royal, where our muse tonight is set. So, I mean, I just support all aspects of archaeological uh, research and research into the historic environment on our properties, which sounds great and really archaeological. The reality of that is mostly working with my colleagues because they want to put another sewer through things. Do do a lot of sewers one way or another. Um, um, but, uh, you know, it's generally pitch in with the archaeological stuff where it's useful to supporting the life of National Trust properties. Sometimes we get to do a bit of interesting research where we think there's opportunities as well, and that kind of set the background a little bit to the episode that hopefully people have just seen. Well, thank you for that. Uh, 75 properties. Yep. Wow. They're kind of grouped together now, so we, we, uh, we've got uh, 12 property groups I think it is across my patch each of which has a general manager but for a lot of those it's the kind of patchwork of, of little pieces of ground so the biggest national trust estate not up in, in in the uplands is at Wallington in Northumberland and it's about 57 square kilometers but the smallest property is just outside Ripon uh, a property called the Sharrow Cross which is about the size of a tabletop and it's a, it's a medieval sanctuary cross. So if you got inside the ring of stones, uh, set a, a league away from Ripon uh, Cathedral, then you were in the sanctuary of the church and they couldn't get you. Mm. Um, so the last yes. surviving one of these was the first property given to the National Trust in Yorkshire in 1899. Wow. Mark, I remember uh, Tash and I, we, we filmed, a, I think it's out at the end of this series, actually, we filmed a kind of best of which just spoke to all the dreams of my little 1980s child heart. Aww. But um, we did a best of, and I remember Tash in that, we were asked to choose our favourite episodes, and you said it's like asking a parent to choose between their children. But I'm just thinking, like, I was like, if you have 75 children, like you do, you know, and choosing between them, but I know you've got a favourite. I think this is your favourite. I, 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 you know. Is it? Yeah, <laughs> kind of, kind of is, yes. So, I mean, you, you do perfect the Bruce Forsyth impersonation and they're all my favourite when, when I'm on that particular property. But yeah, Fountains and Studies a bit special. Um, it's where I first worked when I came to work the Trust. So that will be 35 years ago in September. Yep, I know what you're all thinking. Parents wedded to the concept of child labour. Um, and But I'm still here. Um, and they were lovely enough to let me live in Jacobean Fountains Hall at the other end of the property from where we, we dug. So for seven years, that was my home in this 17th century house with Fountains Abbey and the water gardens as my back garden. Other back gardens have been a bit of a disappointment since then, to be brutally honest. Um, and it was just bliss. Um, it, it was a pretty basic lifestyle. There were three working radiators when I moved in. There was only one left by the end and I wasn't allowed to have a television. So uh, it was quite a monastic existence, but it was extraordinarily special. So uh, Appropriately monastic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then less monastically, I had my wedding reception there. Um, and it was one we had 200 guests and, and using used the solarium of the abbey for our reception and then my mum's ashes are there and there's kind of you know a lot of pretty hefty personal commitment to this place and it's kept me thoroughly entertained all this time and uh, you'd kind of hope that I knew what was there by the time I've spent that long there but I keep finding the mistakes I've made and the corners which I don't understand at all so uh, it all comes as new and fresh. And we just have an update. We have John Henry in the waiting room and I'm going to be adding him into the chat right now. Excellent. 
oh what a great photo but I don't think actually people in the live stream can see this only when John turns his John Henry turns his camera on will you actually see him I think is how it works on live streams uh but oh yeah oh, fresh from hello. Boston hello sorry a bit late Sorry. You made it back. You've been, John Henry, am I wrong? You've been in Glastonbury because you were like invited to go and like the coolest thing you could imagine. Basically. I was, yeah. Two years in a row. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'm a bit tired, but you know, we move. I'm here. I'm here. Well, I was saying before we, we came on, we were a bit, you know, we knew you hadn't been able to join us. We were a bit worried you got packed with Elton John's luggage or something. <laughs> 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 oh imagine yeah I hear, I hear he left in like I heard he got home in 30 minutes after the set by a helicopter so that's how that's how we should be on on set I think yeah disappointing oh, sorry, it wasn't not... I'm so sorry we're not supposed to mention that, that you don't get you don't get a helicopter till you're in your third series <laughs> <laughs> gotta stick it out man yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking Elton was slumming it he normally travels by rocket doesn't he oh true uh... I tell you what, not to just talk about Glastonbury, but that was very good. That was a great set. It was a uh, super. Yeah. yeah, and being in person, I was right next to. I don't think you could see on the TV that well, but like a rocket went off as part of the show from the crowd, and I was right next wow. to it during the course for Rocket Man, and I was like, <laughs> 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 anyway, archaeology. Well, I'm sure there the is archaeology archaeology the archaeology of Glastonbury Festival. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure the archaeology of Woodstock Festival, that. haven't they? They did Woodstock. Did oh, they? Yeah, yeah. I have to Google it. The magnetometry would be a nightmare, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> True. <laughs> All the pull rings, no, not seeing yeah. anything. Like that. Personally, I'm quite a fan of you know chemical analysis, uh, so that'd be interesting. Uh, mm. well, you could do you could do some of that with Glastonbury, I'd imagine. This... Guys? Okay, I'm going to rein it <laughs> in now. Yeah, totally <laughs> okay. I'm going to rein it in. So uh, we've got Mark's introduction, and just a quick uh, hello to everyone else. We've got. Uh, I was about to say. I was about to say we've got Chloe Scott on, on the stream. I don't know why I was about to say that. There's <laughs> some news. There's some news today. we should know. <laughs> <laughs> so we have joining us on this live stream: Dr. Chloe Duckworth, Chris Scott, John F Henry Phillips. John, where's your Henry in your name? What's going oh, on? Oh, that does that. It sets that to default. Let me change it. And then we have myself natasha bilson so thank you so much for joining the live stream if you have any questions following the episode please leave them in the youtube chat box if you're watching this on catch up leave it in the comment section and maybe we'll be able to answer it on our next live stream which will be next tuesday uh so this episode we were at the beautiful national trust site i think the technical long name is like fountains abbey and studley royal park yep that's right i Excellent. also saw Thank you. Thank you. I'm surprised I remembered it all. <laughs> I've been using that tag a lot in lots of social media posts. So that's probably why I remember it so much. It's ingrained in my brain now. <laughs> um, and uh, I think first off, Chris, yeah. why this site? So for all of you who but, don't know, Chris is the consultant on the job. So I, I have a great job really um, on the on the TV show. And I get to look at and look for various sites that that we might go and investigate as part of the great british dig um which is really exciting and i think last time i was talking about i, I have looked at probably thousands of sites um to get down to the 22 or 24 programs i think we've made so far for the great british dig um but this one was a really easy decision from my point of view that um mark and i've known each other for a very long time um and so I was chatting, to, in reality, I was chatting to Mark and looking for places and he suggested a site he knew quite well. Um, but also from the point of view of, of making the programme, we are looking for, or I'm looking for sites really, I think where we can, we can really make a difference in doing some targeted archaeology that works to make a really interesting TV programme where there's a good story to tell. And, and obviously Fountains and Studley have got loads of great stories. I'm sure we'll probably get into a little bit of that. So from the point of view of telling a good story for TV, this site is amazing. There's so many good stories. Um, but also there's there was a real job of work that we could do through the programme of helping the National Trust to understand 
from a conservation point of view. Mark will talk about this anyway, but um, helping the National Trust to understand from a conservation point of view more about the archaeology of the house and how that can be looked after for everyone, but also from the story point of view, putting the house back in the middle of that of that incredible landscape is a really exciting story for an archaeologist anyway who's I've been lucky like Mark to work in in the Studley landscape a little bit and uh that's having knowing a little bit about that landscape but putting the house where the people stayed and went out on their days out in, in those gardens from uh is really really exciting I think story that I wanted ideally to tell as part of the program I'm just thinking back to when we had the chance to actually see some of the other sites. So we got to go to Fountains Abbey. Mark gave us a little tour. Amazing. I think it was on our mm. first night. I think it was our first day. Okay. I think, yeah. I think it was. First or second day. Yeah. And um, Mark was insisting that you've got to do it right now because I know you're going to be busy later. And he was right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such, how, like, how many acres is the property? It's about 850 acres in total. Wow. Um, it, it's only a tiny fragment at the middle of the estate that the the Aislip is owned and it's just that the bit we look after is with a little bit sub added to, onto the side is just the hub which the West Riding County Council bought from the last private family who owned the estate in 1966 so they bought it as a, um, a country park for um, a public access into the parkland for free uh, and still paying the traditional entrance fee to get into the gardens um, and the abbey bit of it but when you really get your mind blown about the gardens that you see today is when you realize that that was just a kind of gem in the middle and in a diadem of a, this huge landscape so I mean tra to travel the whole of a designed landscape probably about a 30 mile journey and it was huge landscape art it wasn't kept up for very long. The outlying bits weren't maintained. They withered away. And the bit that you see now is kind of constricted and constricted inwards into what made a good day out for tourists in the Victorian period. So they'd be taking spa waters and Harrogate, fancy, you know, fancy a day out. So there's an ideal walk around that little middle bit. And all this huge landscape art project around it, you know, was pretty much unknown and disappeared out of understanding. And a lot of my time on the estate has been finding that picture and putting it back together again. Hmm. Now, John Henry and Chloe, what would be your highlights from the excavations that we had while we were there? Or even just the week in general, what would your highlights be? Chloe, do you want to go first? Oh, I think you're on mute. Uh, uh, oh. um, I'm happy to go first. Um, I mean, it was obviously it's beautiful. Um, it's an incredible place. It's enormous. That I think that actually does come through on on the TV because you know we have the advantage these days of drone photography, and you see it panning out. It's this incredible, enormous landscape. And I think we just don't we don't really appreciate talking of landscape. You know, archaeology is about stuff, <clears throat> but stuff isn't always small. Um, it's not always the little thing that you dig up and we dug up some amazing things and Tash in particular in your trench um some very kind of fancy and expensive things but there are the, there's the small scale but also it's about stuff in general and stuff can be large scale and when you look at that and you think about the effort that goes into basically crafting a landscape mm. on that to that scale it's just extraordinary and just being there and thinking about that and thinking about the crafting, like the design of a landscape, the, the fact that someone sits down and says, I'm going to design a landscape. And what's that going to be like? What's what fashionable right now? You know, um, we, we did this we, previously with Mark when we were at Beninborough um, in Yorkshire. And we, you know, this, this idea that the changing fashions of the design of a landscape, you know, for me, that's, um, I find that really, really interesting, just on a human level as someone who's interested in the environment, in, in the so-called natural world, um, and, and all of that stuff, you know, I, I find that absolutely fascinating. So, you know, it's a bit of a, it always feels like a bit of a cop-out answer when you say there's not a particular find that meant something to me, but I think that it's not a cop-out. 
for me in this in these places is it's just fascinating to really get a handle you know just even digging into some kind of earthwork construction and the effort it takes to just dig a small trench in it and when you kind of scale that up in your mind it's a physical thing you go my goodness how much effort is it to actually construct this how many people are needed for that how much money and and, and power and labor goes into that I find that just really profound. It's really fascinating. Um, so for me, that was just one of the many take-homes. And also, it's just a gorgeous place to work. I was out there with my camera, taking photos of the deer on our off, off hours, you know. It was, yeah, everything. It's an, an incredible place. And Mark gave us this wonderful tour of, of Fountains Abbey, which magical, you know. So magical. Oh, I wish I could go back, actually. But Mark, it reminds me, you have a book on garden archaeology or was it it was on garden archaeology correct i put um, a link in the description from last oh he's doing a john Henry. Like, oh i just happened to oh him. my god catastrophe oh, i thought it was in reach and i can't <laughs> see where the blasted thing is yes wonder of the north uh which is the history of fountains abbey and studley royal so it pulled together the first 25 years of research to you know, remake the story of the two places and, and to give it a narrative because let's say we've just kind of forgotten the extent of it. Um, and nationally, we forgot about gardens in the early 20th century and that it was kind of a surprise to rediscover that we'd actually led the world in designed landscapes. Um, and there's been a kind of archeological and historical progression for, for recapturing these places um, really since the 1950s onwards. Um, you know, it really wasn't an appreciation of, of just how much was embraced by, by this process. So Wonder of the North tells that story. Uh, Boydell Press, ideal wedding present, gift to your pets, milkman, et cetera, et cetera. Christmas is coming. It's just a great doorstop. Yeah. Well, and, and two of them with a slab over the top, fabulous garden table. Um, just to say <laughs> as well, um, I don't know if the viewers are aware, but every single one of the books you can see in Mark's background there were written by him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you turn around, you can see the other three walls as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, that's so that, that's that's the wonder of the north. Just said it again, just in case people missed the title. And uh, I'll put a link in the description below for anybody yeah. who's interested in purchasing that. But it's all about garden archaeology, as I said in Benbra. After Benbra, I was like, wow, I think I like garden archaeology, and I thought I wouldn't as being more into urban, yeah. urban archaeology. Ash, do you remember how? Do you remember how rude we were about? We were like, we were a bit rude about Mark. I'm so sorry to admit this. I think we missed it on the Bembra episode, but we were like, it's not about digging a yeah, garden. Yeah. garden. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, is that is not is that not the whole point of the the show? Am I missing no, something? No, because normally we're digging gardens to look. Garden. We didn't know about digging a garden to look for a garden. I think that was our issue. Got you. Got and you. then you know, and then we did it, and we both sort of went, oh yeah, humble pie. Mm -hmm. But I know you're talk we're talking about Studley tonight, but just you mentioned Benningborough and kind of where's, where, you know, what's the big win from the fantastic work that you do on the programme and how much it delivered for us at Benningborough. And, and you might remember that the reason, one of the reasons why we were interested in one of the sites you explored was that we're going to be putting a 21st century garden in. So it's always layers of garden fashion. And you found that fabulous brick retaining wall. We've been working on the site for the two years since you were there. We now have ground penetrating radar and magnetometry from the site and a fantastic group of volunteers, some of whom came along were on the program. Roads to the Past have so far dug 48 test pits and four larger trenches, and we've put the reality into the geophysics. So we know now what that wall is, more about what that wall is doing. We think it's kind of like castellations, a crinkle crankle wall. And we found a return going off from the east end of it that lines up with all the archaeology outside the haha. -ha. I mean, he's really amazing. fabulous. So and, much we're, progress. and we're a meter down through stratified archaeology on, on one part of it. And we're going to be opening up a, another area to be on show for excavation during Festival of British Archaeology in a couple of weeks' time. So all building on the stuff that you first found and um, we've really you know taken that expansion of knowledge further and it's shaping all the conservation work that we're doing there before the garden starts getting built in september 
And I'm delighted Absolutely. to tell you that pretty, pretty much all the things we're doing for the garden are going fairly superficial and into a landscaping layer that sealed all the interesting stuff. So the interesting archaeology is going to be preserved underneath it. Uh, but we're just having this look before it's put beyond access for the next 100 years with the, with the next garden in the sequence. I love it. Thank you for the update on Benbra. For anyone who's not watched the episode, you can catch up on uh, channel4.com slash the Great British Dig. Or you can just quickly Google it and it'll come up. Uh, but it's another great episode based at National Trust site, hence why we're talking about it. So bringing back to Studley Royal, John Henry, favourite moment, trench, find on this site? Um, I mean, I liked the uh, I liked the chandelier piece, like in terms of an actual little artefact. Um, but, you know, I hope this isn't a cop-out answer, but like genuinely the thing with uh, that site was uh, I really, the people that we worked with, um, it was so nice, like being there in that amazing surrounding um, and having people like Mark who were like so passionate about the place, you know, having experts that are that passionate about it and like Georgina and Katie and the people that I dug the trench with, just, um, just everyone there being so thrilled to be, you know, in such a wonderful place was such a joy to go to work every day. And, you know, you can, you can turn up to these places and not know anything about them other than, you know, we're doing them for the show. Well, obviously, I read the, I read about them before I get there. But um, it's got but four it's, copies of my book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're all worn out now. <laughs> but no, just like seeing how passionate everyone else is about something, even if it's not like your might not be your sort of specific interest in terms of history is so sort of um it catches on you know and by the end of like the first day you're like oh you know i get it this place is really amazing um and not just for the like the beautiful landscape just how you know the history of it and all that sort of thing so just yeah just the people that energy and joy is sort of uh contagious i think places like that so yeah. that would be my answer i hope that's that's so cool. that's so lovely because i really feel that that i as an archaeologist, I kind of moved away a lot from British archaeology and it was actually working on the show that brought me back into loving it. And a big part of that, apart from kind of going, oh my gosh, these were the landscapes of my childhood and all this stuff, a big part of that was just working with people and their passion. Mm. Absolutely, I'm just 100% sold now, you know, on that. So I, I totally feel that, John Henry, like that. The way that other people and their interests and passion can excite you about a place and make you realise how cool and interesting it is. Yeah, I think people can get me interested in anything if, they, if you can just see that they really love it. You know, I'm a real sucker for that. Like Mark, I remember Mark, you telling me about the the bees that lived in um your old house. <laughs> I walked away from that being like, yes, man, bees are sick. <laughs> <laughs> about now, so I got a bee, a bee got stuck down my top today. Um, and I was panicking, and I'd forgotten okay. about the bees, your bee story. But now, now you say it, JH, I remember it really. <laughs> right. That's, sorry, that was a random. You didn't notice me to know that. Too much yeah. bee information. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I explain what that story is about? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, let's yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> so, round the side of Fountains Hall, which is this beautiful 17th century mansion, which we didn't get to in the program because it's just so much stuff, um, where I used to live. Coming up on the second floor, there is a blocked out window with concreted over and this sort of black smudge at the edge of it. And in the 35 years I've known the place, every summer, there are lots and lots of bees coming and going out of that hole. Nobody's ever been in behind it. There must be decades, hundreds of years of wax and, and honey in this void in the walls. And some years ago, bee experts were looking at what these bees were and they were black bees now the black bee is the type of bee that the monks would have would have had the bees of medieval england and they were believed to have died out but there are now black bees in this country that were imported from italy at the beginning of the, the 20th century but the bee experts came and they looked at these ones and they're not the italian black bees we think that these are survivors of the monastic hives who've been around naturally in this landscape um, and have made their home in Fountains Hall, who knows how far back, but that colony keeps going, keeps using using the same nesting place, which is just magical, isn't it? It's amazing. It keeps going itself. I think we need yeah. to like make a documentary about these black bees. Honestly. 
I'm, I'm, I just love that B story. Yeah, it's great. And when you pointed up, I remember you showing us. We were like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> and then you started going on, and we're like, "Oh wow, this is this is amazing." <laughs> and I was told a story about by the architect for the West Riding, who was first responsible for looking after the place when it came to public ownership. And one of the the buildings in the gardens is called the Temple of Fame, and it's a rotundo, it's eight columns supporting a domed roof. Um, and it's an allegory on the nature of fame because you see this and you think it's a lovely stone built building and then when you tap it it's actually made of wooden plaster and it's an allegory about the nature of fame being something hollow and and artificial but this thing had fallen into really serious decay and the building you see now is is you know basically a replication of the bits which which was still surviving but when John took it over there were swarms of these bees living in the dome of the temple and there was honey running out down around the columns <clears throat> and you just think you know the 18th century landscapists loved an allegory and they'd have you know died for that yeah. it's just a perfect picture of this, this building of plenty. We have a great comment on YouTube from Steve who says wow living archaeology so true like yeah it's literally yeah. living history I love it great it's, yeah. it's amazing so now in terms of chris i'm going to ask you a question i need to think of something to ask you as a phil we need to ask you something <laughs> uh what was your highlight of study boy um i i think there are probably a couple of things i think the ability to i loved the end to our story about the tree falling over and pulling up some of the archaeology from underneath I, I think that's such a brilliant brilliant um uh, way of describing and showing people how often the archaeology <clears throat> can be just underneath the surface um and how important that is and it, it illustrated i think really well how important it is to the the that people like the National Trust and organisations like the National Trust exist to look after these places. And that showed just how um, just how fragile sometimes some of the, the landscape and, and the archaeology can be. Um, on the other side, I think that fantastic cellar as a piece of beautiful structural archaeology um, and just well-made historic fabric sitting under the ground in that way, how thumping great pieces of of the past can be just under the ground surface as well i think it was a fabulous kind of um thing to see and be able to excavate on the program so for me probably those two things really really exciting um and being able to tell the overall a bit of the overall story through through the various scenes as well just brilliant brilliant it was great fun, actually. The trench, the cellar trench was was amazing. Yeah, I uh, think in my job as well, obviously, one of my things is, is helping to design and, and sort of figure out where we're going to dig. So the fact we had archaeology in every trench, that, that meant I could clock off, job done, go home, back to the bar. <laughs> um, so on this... You were so. in the trench with us. Don't try and play cool. <laughs> Yeah, you were I in that cellar trench. I remember you. Being... That was like, yeah, Chris, not acknowledging the amount of work he does, but also, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, he's he's being way too modest. I mean, one of the things that's you know, that means a, a thousand memories to pick from those five days. But how hard Chris works, and he's the first bloke on the site in the morning and the last one off it in the evening. Um, you know, and that was that was twelve hours plus on this one. That's really he works true, incredibly yeah. hard. It's yeah. it's really true because you've got you've got you know you've got us lot who kind of I don't know what we do really we sort of flap in and out. But you've got you know you've got um, you've got people who are working in archaeology who were purely there to help us with digging and recording that, and they have like a lot of hours. And it's a long day for them, and then you've got the crew. And they have long hours. It's a lot of day, like a long day for them. But those hours and those long days don't necessarily kind of coincide. So the people who have to be there for all of that definitely, I think, get the most, the, the longest days and the longest hours. So yes, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's easy it's a when lot. you enjoy it. Do you though, Chris? Are you just saying that? <laughs> you feel like you have to. Yeah, I was going to say that. You know, 
I agree with all the sentiment, but he does also choose to do a uh, to turn up to taunt us at the uh, little extra bits we film at yoga studios and pubs and <laughs> yeah, he, does <laughs> he doesn't need to be there. Yeah, the he doesn't have to be there for that, yeah. but he does like to go. That's, that's true. That's the payoff. <laughs> oh, thank goodness the yoga scene was cut nicely such a that's such a you shame you didn't see oh. what yeah. happened oh. you did not see what happened in that yoga Ash, studio you've got to tell that story i think i think the nation <laughs> needs that in their life no, no, I, I, Chris, what happens in the yoga scene stays in the yoga, stays in the yoga scene <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, we did some yoga. Let's put it that yeah. way. We did some yoga. Yeah. And the so whole crew. Me, is that you and is that you and Hugh Dennis? Yes, Hugh and I were doing yoga with the individuals who were there for yoga. Uh, they got some mats out. We joined them and the crew were loving it. Okay. I mean, I, I just remember looking, I'd see that Chris red face laughing, but you can't make any noise, right? So everyone's just like <laughs> dead quiet. And I'm just there like a bumbling idiot, just like bursting out laughing at these stretches with these how ropes. Flexible, how flexible, who was more flexible, you or Hugh? Tash. Actually, I had no, I was surprised at how well I did. I was you were, surprised. Were you wearing jeans? The, I was dunking. in my jeans, but I dig yeah. in jeans. I don't have issues. Like I I could, I mean, I, I dug in jeans for like 10 years, honestly, but they're, they're not, denim is not denim, you know, it's, yeah. it's. Uh, cotton mixed with something else so. Uh, so i can confirm hugh dennis who is amazing at so at lots of things and is in incredible at his job is not incredible at yoga yeah. <laughs> but, but let, let's be fair <laughs> downward dig is already nominated for the bafta pun of uh, 2023 it was and just brilliant. way ahead of the competition <laughs> that's I where think... he earns his money with that sort of joke, that sort I mean... of thing <laughs> it, it was, you know, I don't even remember him saying it. I think I was just, no, this was even before we did anything. I don't remember, I don't remember that joke, but that was a brilliant joke when I was watching it back. <laughs> so smart. So smart. I mean, isn't it sometimes, Tash? Do you feel that? Like sometimes I'll watch an episode and I'll go, huh? I'll be like, oh, nice joke, Chloe. Don't remember saying that. And I'll watch the episode and I'll go, oh, Oh, that was pretty, that was pretty good. Well, um, I, was, but I, I, I have no memory of it happening, but it must have happened because it is there. Someone filmed it. But it was like my Wiley Coyote joke. I uh, I only watched the show back like an hour ago, and I was watching it with someone, and they were like, "What? What does that mean?" And I was like, "Because I was like, it's a good line." And then yeah. I was thinking, "Is there?" And I was frantically googling like Wiley Coyote train track. So, and what's I, your Wiley Coyote joke, mate? Um, the people in the pump house would like pump the water with like one person on each end, and I said it was like Wiley e. Coyote. Oh yeah, like when on the little train tracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I was yeah. going through Google Images, and I could only I couldn't find one for ages, and I was going, oh no, oh no, it's not a good joke. But then I found one image, and I screenshotted it just in case anyone ever comes at me. I go, look, his one. It happened once. All right. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it was a great contact. joke, but mainly for the over 40s. I think that was <laughs> very nice of you yeah. to step out of your generation and deal with you. Yeah. I, just, I just want everyone to know that I'm exclusively communicating with the over 40s and any any accidental byproducts of that that accidentally tap into anyone under 40 that they might like. I'm very happy that I was able to do that, but it's absolutely unintentional because I've Just no get down with the kids occasionally. I don't know how to talk to younger people. Yeah. It's good. Good job, your lecturer, Chloe. No, yeah, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> the, the thing is, uh, yeah, I've just absolutely cornered myself there, haven't I? <laughs> Get yourself down deep, it's fine. Thanks for saying so little, and then just what you did say being an absolute targeted bullet. It's snipe, wasn't it? Absolute yeah. snipe. Sniper. But no, it, it was. It was definitely a really good episode. We got a lot of jokes <laughs> in there. Actually. Bring it back. Bring it back. <laughs> yeah, bring it back. We had some good jokes with uh, Hugh in the trench when we were covering the the gilded plaster. That was such a lovely scene. And I remember we there were so many of us there. Chris, Mark, you were all there. You're actually Mark, was you there? We'll be hiding it from you at this point. We went to surprise Mark on purpose, you know. I can't remember. You were there. We did tell you. Because we went yeah, to surprise I, you yeah, a few times. I did. But the really big surprise was the what Strawberry Blonde did to assemble the teas at the end of episode one, where they cut it down to you saying, this is the first piece of gold we've ever found the Great British Dig. And I think <laughs> we are now going to make it really easy for the police to round up all the illicit metal detectorists <laughs> in North Yorkshire, because we know where they're going to be. Um, <laughs> not that there are any illicit metal detectorists, of course. But uh, yeah, it was a kind of... Okay. 
a <laughs> minute. I just thought lovely. great soundbite. But yeah, I see what you mean. From your it all point goes to show how fake news happens. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Well, it's a bit of gold ish. It was a good soundbite, yeah. but uh, you are right about you know night hawks and things. But be careful of that. I never even saw that until I watched the episode. It was, it was totally yeah. news to me. I don't remember that at all. Yeah. You were busy. Well, you were digging that punch. You were, uh, you were a long way away yeah. in your room. Yeah. I was a long yeah. way. I never even went to your trench. Me. And it was probably Victorian tarting up rather than true. Easily it was a whole other trench that I don't think made it into the show, did it? Did it make it into the show? No. I watched it very quickly. No. No. Um, yeah, so obviously I was digging, don't even remember, guys, I was digging two trenches at once throughout the whole show. Um, <laughs> it was hard. It was a hard week. It's a tough week for you, man. Like, yeah. Backwards and forwards, like Wiley Coyote. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah. To pick up. installed yeah. a train track for me to get across. <laughs> Busy man that week. Yeah. God. yeah. Honestly, yeah. I never saw you, but now I know why you're so far away. I mean, I was <laughs> pretty bad. Is he down? <laughs> Still. But the other, the other fine thing, which the front end got into the program and the back end didn't, was Chloe and her bike chain. Um, and, <laughs> and it was after the third or fourth of them came up and we thought, you know, was there some kind of fight between mods and rockers here in the 1950s? <laughs> We'd not identified. But someone then, Bright Spark, pointed out that they were the equivalent of really top class sash window chains. So instead of having a cord for the sash window, it was a chain. And we know that the windows were replaced when there was a royal visit by George V in 1911. So, mm. but, uh, but the explanation bit didn't quite make it. Was it Hugh, actually, who said that? Because I remember Hugh talking about because he said when he was like a kid and some I don't know one of his jobs was to do the the sash window pulling I can't remember I remember him making a comment about it afterwards I don't know if he was the one who said it but, I mean he surprises people just so you know like he does know his stuff and he surprises us on oh, the spot. Yes. he's always listening he's learning mm-hmm. as well yeah. he listens to he all our chats I, mean, I think that's more of a thing he's like silently listening and then as soon as the cameras go beep he says things from he catches us off, off guard on, on purpose, makes us better, better at yeah, yeah, archaeology. Yeah, he is very, he knows a lot of stuff. You know, he likes to kind of, he likes to kind of keep it under his hat, but he's a real nerd, actually. Very smart. Most well, comedians are. Yeah. To be, to be, a, to be a, a successful comedian, you've got to know your stuff. You've got to know your facts and be very witty, isn't it? Um, so I'm going to quickly have a look at the comments in YouTube. And then, Mark, we need to make a mental note to remember to have a recap of the archaeology, what's actually been going on since, because I realise it's now 6.40. Um, time flies when you're having fun. OK, I'm going to oh, go yeah. through the comments right now. Uh, do, do, do. Uh, so hi, Nigel, Steve, Rosie, Phil and Sasha and Gordonite. Sorry if I mispronounced that, um, but nice to see you all. Uh, right, so we have duh, 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 Steve. Okay, so Steve was asking actually about the trench that Chloe was in, uh, about how we see different phases of the house and how we're able to deconstruct that. So Mark, could you give us a quick recap of that trench and actually what we were able to establish from excavating that? Wow, that's a big one. Is okay. It- so no no that's fine um i mean i was thinking that was quite interesting visually it wasn't so easy for the camera to pick up the stuff that we were working with on the ground but the different phases of walling used different types of material so the different bricks there was different qualities of stone facing and basically the story of studley it, the hall starts off as a medieval building and then it kind of accreted other bits around it and there was a phase when they were thinking, we'll knock all that down. We'll build something new and shiny and fashionable on another part of the property. Um, and more or less where the four of you sat at the beginning of the show with the lake behind you. That's where John Aesley was going to build his new house. But for various reasons, they never got around to it. So then in the 1740s and again in the 1760s, they changed the dressing of it. So they en- encased it in stonework that was of the contemporary fashion. So what we were looking at there were the lowest courses of those walls. And you could actually see where an early wonky bit of walling 
was encased in nice, smart Georgian stuff. And then the Georgian scheme was replaced again. And we're able to put architects' names to some of those faces. So um, it was Daniel Garrett who did the big makeover. But then even uh, less than 20 years later, what Garrett did was replaced by a uh, work by Sir Thomas Robinson. And it was that stonework that you could, you could see. And, and Garrett liked these sort of crazy sub-Gothic uh, themes. And, and they put it up and everybody went, yeah, that's very nice, except it isn't really. So down that came and something that was much more sort of buttoned up, straightforward Palladian architecture based on on classical ideas went in so we could see the outlines of where the clusters of columns were formed on the external angle and the internal angle of the face of the west wing of the building it was the archaeology was so good and there was so much of it and i think that's one of the, the big takeaways from, from from this episode and the excitement that you've all had with it was just I think the scene in, in the in the editing suite when they got it back in was we're going to need a much bigger bin um, because there was there were so many things that we we filmed that just weren't going to fit into 42 minutes. And that kind of applied to that trench as well. Um, and we stopped the excavation of the, the rear part of it because we didn't have the resource to do it properly and just concentrated on that front bit. So that was a bit circular. But hopefully, the, you know, you take the bits out of that. There's an answer somewhere to the question. Well, for you, actually, both actually, maybe Mark and, and Chris here, how successful was the dig in terms of the archaeology itself? Obviously, we had an idea of what we may find, it being the house being demolished. We're going to get backfill. You're going to get a layer of demolition, at least, and potential foundations. Um, but in terms of, yeah, the actual the dig, how, how was that? And has there been any further works done since, or do you plan to do any more archaeological works? No, we that the work that you did with us did what we wanted it to do at this stage. So Chris told you, you know, has picked up the, the lovely beginning to it, the, the tree being knocked down by Storm Harwin. Um, and that was did a huge amount of damage across the countryside and National Trust estates. You know, we lost 5,000 trees on one, one estate, uh, for example. Um, and, you know, that's all, that is really regrettable. We can't afford to lose these veteran trees. So I've done the proper bit now, because the reality is for 30 years, I've been trying to get and chop the trees off that site because I know the archaeology is there and I'm quite concerned about it. And, uh, you yeah, that hasn't happened yet. So there was a morning in December uh, would it have been 21 when you can picture the scene on the frosty morning the day after the storm and and this tree has come down and the rangers phoned me up and said there's this brickwork underneath it and there's the three of them with the lower lips sort of slightly trembling a bit and, and a tear forming in the eye that they've lost their tree and it's me trying not to go <laughs> it's so exciting um oh they think you know that one's gone it'll expose some of the others maybe they'll fall over oh that would be terrible i mm -hmm. said trying to sound sincere um so it's an ill wind that that blows no good uh in the round but you know the way the archaeology was going down beneath there we could see that there was deep loose stratigraphy that wasn't superficial surviving masonry and given that we had a we had knowledge that there were cellars in the building, though we didn't know precisely where they were. The possibility that this was a cellar that was showing itself came up. And then the, the real imperative is that that parkland's open public access. Anybody can walk over it. And then we're suddenly aware that there is a void here and we have no idea how it was filled or whether it's stable or whether, you know, there's brick vaulting that's surviving, but it's on its last legs and it collapses when some poor person walks over it. You know, that's not the right place for us to be. So we could see from that that we really needed to look at that and, and establish the stability of the site and, and its safety going forwards. Um, so that was spectacularly achieved by the project and we've now reinstated the site. Um, there's, I mean, a whole load of politics to managing any bit of landscape. Um, I think the hall falls into the category, we know how important it is to that World Heritage Site and that 
ability to walk out of the you know, that, that the Aislabies walked out of that place and then they did this great artistic creation spreading across the countryside that's the point of origin and no visitor gets that today you know there's nothing to see on the site at all that takes you to that point and it's extraordinary that it's just vanished and it's just vanished from knowledge in such a short period of time i really depressed myself at the weekend and i was thinking when i first came to this estate it was only 42 years ago that the place came caught fire and burnt down it's getting closer to double that now but it's amazing that something so comparatively contemporary had, had just disappeared so you know the national one of the great virtues of a trust is that we own places in perpetuity so we can come to this at some point when it is appropriate to do so. And I would love to see some form of representation of that house where people can see it and engage with it. And particularly, you know, if they know the estate well already and they're frequent return visitors, they could see it a different way uh, mm -hmm. with, with plugging that piece of knowledge in, in, into place. But for a moment, it rests there and it's something we can come back to. And I just want to quickly add, uh, for anyone watching this, you can support the National Trust's work by opening a membership. You have every year an annual membership, personal, joint, family, um, or whenever you visit a property, the money goes directly back into supporting the Trust's work. Even by using their car park, the money all goes in. So definitely have a look if you're interested. I'll put a link in the description uh, as well. Best, best, best scones in the business, aren't they, National Trust? Oh, mm. We'll see. Delightful. I live near um, Anglesey Abbey. Uh, mm -hmm. Amazing. It's. I love a day out there. I just love a National Trust day out. I just remembered actually. You were you were going on about the calf. You were like, I want to go to the calf, and we yeah, go go to the National buggy. Trust cafe is legendary. I remember you saying this now. We didn't get to go, did we? We no, didn't get to go. No. That was the one downside about this week's episode was there was no National Trust cafe. It was devastating because it's it's like. <laughs> It's like seeing the golden arches of McDonald's and then getting there and there's no Big Mac, you know what I mean? But it's still good. Still good. But <laughs> and it's... You're too busy digging all those trenches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you, you were, were, you were working so working so hard. And and yeah. it's a shame because there is that lovely cafe by the lake. And you sit outside there with one of your tasty comestibules, which thank you so much for, for promoting them. You know, you sit at that table and you own the place. Mm. And that, I mean, it's so much a part of what the gardens were designed to do. And they were places to take your ease. There were probably four different kitchens in different parts of the, of the gardens. So, you know, having refreshments, having, having meals, listening to music, reading, playing sports in these gardens were all part of what it was about. It was putting yourself into a painted landscape except it really existed and I think whenever you get to play with the gardens in that way you step into the shoes of the 18th century owners and you you really get a feeling that this is my place it's you know where I am I'm relaxed and I'm allowed to play and I think it's one and one of the reasons I so love working for the organization is that that it makes it available for everybody um, and you can go and have that sense of, of personal ownership in, in our places. And if it ever feels like you're not achieving that, then we're, you know, we're not doing the best thing we possibly can. But studly, I think that it, people, people fall in love with it in exactly that way. And mm. despite the fact that you guys were so frantic, you know, if you'd not seen it before, it got under your skin, I think. Um, well, I so see hopefully it's... we're doing something right. Thinking about that, I, I didn't actually see the... Um, like all the water features and all that stuff until like the very last day. So and I we kind of that press in... photo, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. Know. Were, were you the same? I can't remember, but I, yeah, I didn't see him until that day. You've spoiled the magic of TV here, John, because because that that's the first that was the, that's the first scene. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were all upset though that we hadn't seen it. We're like, what? Yeah. I, mean, I think John Henry, John Henry just forgot. It, you know, the water features, memory of the goldfish. <laughs> um, oh yeah, but anyway. You weren't looking a, in the direction of the water at the time. Biceps yet. of a coyote, though. So, you know. <laughs> but, but, you know, <laughs> aside, aside from ruining the TV magic, my point was uh, that it was just so amazing. Like, at the end, it's just like, oh, my God, like, this is what was 
this is everything. This is what so I've been hearing about all week. And yeah, it's absolutely stunning. It just blew me away. Um, so I'm jealous of, well, I'm disappointed that I didn't get to sit there with a cup of tea. That would have been an absolute dream. Um, but well, I'll go, I, I, I'll go come back. back. Let's yeah, know gonna... you're coming back and we'll make sure <laughs> you place properly. And uh, hopefully after all this promotion of National Trust tea and scones, you know, next time. You'll get one for free. House. <laughs> 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 I'll Instagram make sure happens. that happens. Thank you very Definitely. much, Mark. I appreciate it. <laughs> is that it. for all of us, Mark, or is that just for John? Harry? Oh yes. Oh no, for you all. And you, you all are. You're such a joy to work with, and it goes Hugh as well, and everybody at Strawberry Blonde. It's just, you know, you almost kind of have. To, I was almost having to pinch myself. You know, <laughs> are we lucky enough to have this happening? Fantastic archaeology, which I've been longing to explore for years and years and years, doing something really important for the management of the place, finding really amazing things. And in a way, the programme didn't have time to give justice to all that stucco work. It's just amazing stuff. Um, and doing it with people who are just a joy to be with, happy and knowledgeable and really adept to everything you're doing um couldn't be better couldn't possibly be better. Oh, mark mark do you making us emotional this is you know you know it's genuinely no but actually i what you said about the stucco there was so much and it was so beautiful and there was so much of it and and this is the thing with we said it i think in the last uh, live stream that often we actually, sorry, you can hear the sound of frying in the background, but proper <laughs> working class roots here, yeah. sausages frying in the pan. Sorry if it's, if you can't, if, if you can't hear that, just ignore what I'm saying. But anyway, um, I'm trying to hear myself. But um, no, Sausages so are also available at some National Trust cafes, <laughs> just saying. Oh, well, I'm on my way. I'm on my way yeah. now. Good pastry as well, sausage roll. But <laughs> no, genuinely like, um, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a big thing like we we come out and we work with you at sites like that and we know they're important we know they're valuable and so it's a big responsibility but just to feel so welcomed and the people we work with because a lot of the volunteers we work with have been volunteering on this stuff for years and you know you sort of think I, I really want to be sure that they know that their work is appreciated and it's represented um, and just just such generosity in letting us do that and work with them like it is really doing this is really like it turns you into a horrible lovey doesn't it you become like the worst like lovey like theater lovey you're like darling your work is so but, but it's true because everyone who's involved is so generous with mm -hmm. what they do and with and with sharing that and you know, it's just, I mean, yeah. it's just great. Like, it's just it's showcasing amazing stuff that people are actually doing and have been doing for years. Yeah. And, and, and but, yeah, the lovey thing is true, but it's because, because they really mean it and they feel that way. Yeah. You know, it's not quite like the theatre one where, you know, that wonderful phrase about, oh, darling, is it wonderful just wasn't the word. Um, <laughs> kind of double edged. So we mean it. It was all good. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's absolutely, that's absolutely the case. Like, you know, the, the kind of, it is really, you know, you really know that that people are really in this because they care. Because let's face it, most archaeologists are underpaid and overqualified. <laughs> um, and you know, if you're in it, you really care, mm. and that just comes across. And it's a privilege. Yeah. And that's what, you know, the Great British Dig is about bringing the community into archaeology and igniting the passion for individuals who may have had that as a child, but didn't have the opportunity to, or maybe they were smart enough not to actually follow a career in it and now spending their time as a hobby doing it. And we're so great to have so the opportunity. So much archaeology bashing on this channel. No, it's, hey, it's the truth. <laughs> every, it's, week, I, every week. <laughs> it's not bashing. We're just, it's, <laughs> it's just normal stuff. What are you talking about, JH? Just how we end up chatting on Instagram because I made a comment that's about a work life balance, you know? That's, that's for another true. time. That's true. But, but, you know, that's everything's valid what we've said. But I just want to say that uh, we did have a comment from David, who is the fine specialist on this week's episode. And he wants to give another big thank you to every single volunteer who helped him uh, with the fines processing. We mentioned, I don't, nobody, yeah. you didn't get to see how much there was. 
there was a lot and so he wanted to give a big thank you to the individuals who helped and in general every single person the commercial archaeology unit as well all those individuals who are part of it it's not just the people that you see on the screen there's many people behind as we've touched upon through this episode live stream um but as we come up to wrapping it i just want to quickly um go over two more comments that i saw I, uh, can i just butt in for a second before yeah, I go to the comments um I just got a message saying my mum's watching this and she'll be absolutely mortified if we say hello to her. So can we um we just give my mum a little... Hi, what's your mum's name? Jill, Jillian. isn't it? Jillian, yeah. Hi, Jillian. Hi, Jillian. I don't want to ratify you, but we met you and you were really lovely, so hi. <laughs> right, cheers. <laughs> I didn't, but can you come if you do another episode on the oh, National Trust? I'll tell you what, she <laughs> loves the National Trust even more than I do. So I think that's where I've got my love of it from, you know, a nice day out. Well, anyway, we'll get back into that again. <laughs> no, I love that. I, love I think that. you'll be on the next series of. Uh, do, they, do they even advertise National Trust? I don't know. Yeah, I've if been. Um, do, John Henry is clearly going to be a great. Advertiser. Well, there was that. There's that show, isn't there? Uh, Secrets of the National Treasures, of the National Trust, something like that. That's been yes. on. They yeah, did an amazing one recently about Paul McCartney's house. Obviously, I'm a like diehard Beatles fan, and they went and um, just promoting another show here. They went and uh, like lost control here, Tash. Yeah. They tried. They tried to like find the original Paul McCartney's graffiti on the bathroom window, a uh, bathroom wall where he'd write mm. the songs. Um, oh, it's so good. Go and watch but it. I don't like Beatles, so I'm going to change the topic. So anyway, um, <laughs> we're going to go back to the comments, okay? Because we are coming up to the one hour mark. Uh, we've got next week with with all of us again, so don't worry. Okay, oh, so please. two comments. Uh, we have Rosie who we'll was talking. <laughs> I will mute. I will mute you all. <laughs> <laughs> don't make me <laughs> okay so we've got rosie's comment um and actually this is actually really interesting i should have asked this earlier so great comment from rosie who was asking how were the mortar and paint clues of the house on the tree stump preserved in the time between the tree falling and filming now this is great because people might not realize that when we turn up that's the conditions that we're turning up you know that the tree roots are there they're exposing what they're exposing and it's not been touched and uh there's a scene where I am literally picking out a piece of what I saw. I originally thought it might be copper because I saw it as a um, green and I picked up, I looked, I was like, oh, that's no, plaster. I made a comment. It's painted, you know, didn't have hindsight then to know that we would find a lot of painted. Well, actually, did we find how much painted plaster do we find on this episode? I don't well, want to get into I mean, the surface stuff was like was three lot. trestle tables full. Yeah. Mm, so yeah. much. Yeah. Is, is the official terminology like a metric um, large tons? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we have the a next lot. comment from Phil. Uh, Phil had another great comment, actually, and it's it's more to do with, I guess, how we, maybe how the show was conveyed. So Phil's asking, well, Phil says, hi, all great to see you back on again. Geophys could have been a natural thing to start with, but do you think it would have been any help in reaching your objectives on this dig? Mark, has great, geophysics been done? Great question. Uh, yes, we have done geophysics on site in the past, um, but in a way it's slightly redundant because the building uh, survived and was recorded on an ordnance survey mapping. Uh, so it's great for things like picking up external structures that the, the survey didn't record in any great detail, but you do get confusion of sort of 20th century services and things being laid out on top as well. I think where it where there is a theory that it could have been really useful would be in something like ground penetrating radar that might have picked up a cross section uh, across the cellars, but you don't get a run at it because of the trees that were planted on top of the site by the West Riding County Council in the 60s. Um, so the, not only are the trees physically in the way, but the root systems are then in the way, and it's just not good ground for, for, for geophysics. So, you know, in that respect, uh, I'm, I'm not sure it would have added great dimensions to what we already could understand about the site. I think it's really important that people ask these questions, though, and that, mm -hmm. Tash, that you, you run this channel, because um, obviously we've talked about it a lot but you know tv has a limited time we the, the, the people who make it the people who make the show that he's so talented and chris is a part of this have to decide which stories to run with and, and which ones to thread through and obviously that means that some things don't get picked up on so it is really important that people flag up all the range of different ways that we look at this stuff 
archaeologists or any any related profession mapping geophysics scoring environmental stuff I, I think it's yeah it's really great that people are aware of that actually I think it's fantastic you know I, I don't think there are many countries in the world where people are obviously you know I know the people asking these questions are probably quite clued up but there are probably very few places in the world where so many people are that clued up as to know that I think it's great I think it's just a really positive thing mm. Um, and as we are coming up to the hour mark, uh, Mark, is there anything that you'd like to add regarding Studley Royal, the excavations or any post-excavation work, et cetera, that you'd like us to know before we wrap up? Gosh, no, it's a, a great one. I didn't get to do what my favourite bit was. And I okay, think let's do that. But I think I think mine would have been all the carbon we found, which is a bit left field. But actually, we talked about the, this huge amount of beautiful stucco work that was recovered but the most evocative thing was all the evidence for the fire damage on it and we've found pieces where you could see where timbers had come down and the timber itself had protected the plaster but there were the burning along the edges it was really you could almost hear the crackling of fire you could certainly smell it from that night in april 1946 when, when the house met its end and that was that was incredibly powerful about archaeology, not summarizing an epoch in a, a scatter of flint or something like that, but archaeology that's tip of it, that is completely preserving a couple of hours in the history of the site. And there it is. I've only ever once touched it more closely when we dug one of the garden buildings at Studley and which had had staff living in it, and it was pulled down probably about 1925. And the last charge of coal in the fireplace was still there and the fireplace was intact and you wow. could smell it. And it was just <clears throat> walking into that lost building. Mm -hmm. um, but this was right up there with that. And it was it was so special. Um, you know, <laughs> it was quite interesting. Our general manager on the property, Justin, bowled over by the whole thing, loving it. Um, and then it was at the end, we were packing away all the boxes of fines and he kind of went a little bit grey and said to me, we're going to have to find somewhere to, to store these and put them on display. <laughs> yes, Justin, that's the bottom end of this process. So, uh, so that will be the next bit of the story, I think, is how we <clears> get <throat> some of this material out where people can see it. And we're certainly aiming to do that on a temporary basis in the short term. Um, and we're going to do what we can to, to, to give it appropriate prominence in the, a little bit of a long term future. I think I know where that might be, but I'm not saying just now. Well, that's amazing. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm looking forward to potentially seeing this display, photos, maybe maybe one day physically there as well. Who knows? Maybe I'll be able to. Mm -hmm. um, but no, thank you all so much. Everyone's happy before we wrap up? Anything that would like to be said on this episode? <clears throat> Are we all happy? I, oh, I, just, so. I just want to say um, that the next next week's episode is also at a National Trust property. I, th I think we've made quite a thing in the Great British Dig of uh, collaborating with the National Trust. Um, and uh, thank you, Mark, for that. But, you know, I think it's going to be great. It's another great episode coming up. So I'm really excited yeah. to see that one coming out as well. Yeah. yeah. And if National Trust wants to give us membership. We're here. I'm a top member. <laughs> I graduated up from You're, Spons here. <laughs> You're not a member already, Tash? I actually really? was a member. I was. I was I was a member since uh 2013, no, 2012. And mm -hmm. then during the pandemic, I decided love gets yeah, that was very nice because I had not to that much going on at that I had point. to, yeah. I had to uh, I had to cut everything, all my membership. Here's membership. the news, Tash. Pandemic's over. Government <laughs> says it's all right now. <laughs> Just now saying. I need to get a car. <laughs> Once I have a car, then yes, I would uh, definitely get all my memberships back up. Um, but Chris, you want to put yeah, your book just... away, John. Uh, <laughs> Chris, what are you going to say? I was just going to say one final thing. I think obviously um, one of the great things I think that, um, that we shouldn't go away without mentioning is Mark was on about uh, the evidence there that we had for the fire and, and that touching one sort of moment. But I think also the doing sites of this date we were able to talk about people with names and people that we and personalities about which we know more and than a lot of archaeological archaeological sites where that information simply doesn't exist and in this instance i think what what one of the things that was lovely for me um was all of that plaster 
and and finding all of that wonderful plaster, which we only saw a bit of it on the program, as as Mark was saying, there was just so so much. But then being able to go with Mark to the um, to the archives and obviously listen to the person who who produced that that work, yeah. um, Cortese, the, the stucco was talking about. Um, or rather asking for money in that particular instance, but mm -hmm. talking about the work carried out in the house, you know, that, that's one of the incredible strengths of historical archaeology and marrying those things together. We're going to get into back at uh, the Wonder of the North here, aren't we, in a moment, but bringing able to oh, bring... Oh, do you mean things. Wonder of the North, my book? Your book, yeah. Readily yeah, available yeah. to all good booksellers. Yeah, holds doors open tremendously. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the just the uh, bringing that those different types of um, of information together, but, but putting a name and a person's hand onto those finds, I think, is just um, something certainly I'll take away from this from that particular project. It's lovely. And uh, John Henry, you want to say something about your book? No. Oh, it's, it's over. Over. Oh, okay. Um, I thought you had like some promo to do again. Is it like, is it the paperback again somewhere else been launched or something? What, this <laughs> book? <laughs> yeah, that'll be the one. <laughs> the search is now available. <laughs> okay. I'm going to wrap everything up now because it's been over an hour on the live stream. So thank you all so much for tuning in, leaving your questions. If you're watching this on Catch Up, uh, please leave your comments in the comment section. And if you have any questions as well, we'll try and answer them next week as we're actually all going to be back. But we will be talking about the new episode, which airs on Thursday at 9pm on Moor 4. And it's at the beautiful, idyllic Cherryburn, home to Thomas Buick. That's all I'm going to say for now. But um, I was about to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I was going to try and sing the song that we made up, but I'm just going to not even bother. Do it. <laughs> I don't have a guitar. It's not going to happen. Here you go. What, what, are we, what are we doing? Cherry burn, cherry burn. <laughs> <laughs> That's Smelly Cat. Sorry, what? I know, literally. I'm going to do the tune of Smelly Cat, yeah. Um, but it's a fantastic episode again and such a beautiful place. Thank you, Mark, again. Thank you, Chris, Chloe, John Henry for joining us. And we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.